everyone. Welcome to We Working Women live stream. My name is Sherry, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of We Working Women, Amer uh, North America's largest platform for Chinese women's personal and uh, professional development. Every month, we invite extraordinary guests to join us and share their professional knowledge, experience, and wisdom with our audience of over 100,000 subscribers. It's an um, opportunity for We Working Women community to learn from a personal story and a career path of uh, 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 the device uh, guest and a chance for a global uh, guest to connect with our uh, dynamic network of uh, global Chinese women. And today, we are so happy to be joined by uh, Laureen Jane Heller to talk about the secrets of uh, high achieving women. Laureen is um, a uh, it's an executive leadership coach and the founder of a Shine Plus Leadership. Before becoming a leadership coach, Laureen was a director of a communication in, uh, at a Real Venture, uh, one of Canada's leading venture capital firms uh, based in Montreal. During that time, uh, Laureen uh worked with very uh worked with so many uh startup uh, founders and uh, companies and very involved with canadian startup and uh, tech scene prior to that uh laureen had a successful uh, uh career background uh in the communication field and uh she previously served as a communication officer at McGill University and accomplished writer. And uh, she, she's the author of two plays that were professionally produced. And uh, she's contributed to numerous uh, parenting, travel, and the culture uh, magazines. Laureen, looks, you have it all. <laughs> welcome, welcome to our live stream. Mm -hmm. So say hello to our audience. Hi, and thank you for having me. It's so great to be here. So Laureen, uh, you are a leadership coach and uh, some of our audience are not familiar with uh, coach. Uh, can you tell us what kinds of service you provide to your clients? Yeah, for sure. So what I do as a leadership coach is I work with typically ambitious women. Um, I also work with a lot of startup founders to help them to get out of their own way. So a lot of the work that I do is around helping them to be better communicators, to help them to prioritize, to achieve the goals that they have um, by understanding how they are creating obstacles for themselves or approaching things in ways that often kind of keep them stuck rather than helping them to flow through and innovate and come up with the best solutions. Um, so I really help them with both getting clear on what they want to create in their lives and then also how to get there. Oh, that's going to be so interesting for the work, right? <laughs> yeah, it has become a trend in our uh, in recent years, like usually we hear about you should uh, uh, get a coach or you should get, get a mentor. And uh, please tell us what, what's the difference between coach and mentor? Um, so the way that I see it, a mentor is typically a person in your field 
who is a few steps ahead of you on their journey. So there's somebody who, for instance, if you work in the legal field, it'll be a lawyer who, whether it's a man or a woman, there's someone who's achieved what it is that you would like to achieve. And you can learn from their experience and they'll give you their time and their insights to help you on that journey. Um, whereas a coach is not necessarily someone who's done the same type of work that you do, but is really there to help you to be at your best, to help you to get clear on how to get out of your own way, as I said before, and how to create kind of in a concrete way, the path that you want to, to walk. And so it, it could be a combination of both. I know that a lot of the coaching that I do um, a lot of my lived experience is super relevant for my clients. And so I am in that sort of way, a few steps ahead of them in terms of kind of figuring out that perfectionism wasn't serving me or how to connect more deeply with other people. So being able to translate my lived experience into insights that they can gain from, but then also spending a lot of time sort of being a mirror for people so that they can see, oh, this is how I'm getting in my own way. Um, the story that I'm telling myself about how I'm supposed to behave, like having it reflected back to me by my coach, it becomes really clear, oh, I don't want to be that way anymore. And then, and then they can start to move away from the behavior or get clearer on like what it is they really want to be spending their time doing. Because I think so many of us, especially mothers and women, spend a lot of time doing stuff we actually don't want to do and isn't really serving us. We're just doing it because we feel like we should or we have to. We should or we have to. <laughs> okay, so uh, recently uh, you, uh, you was profiled by We Work in Women. And um, in that interview, uh, I, I heard that you said like the first exercise uh, you're, uh, you're, you're doing with your well, coach client to let them understand what, it, uh, what is the fact and then what's the story. Yeah. And uh, why do you ask your clients to do that? And uh, uh, how can, they, can it help them? So humans are storytelling creatures. The way that we make sense of the world is by taking the facts or the data and interpreting it and turning it into stories that then we can remember. So um, as a child, you'll have things that happen to you. And then because of, of the way that you've thought about them, basically the stories you're telling yourself about them, that informs the way that you see the world in the rest of your life. And so really being able to tease apart, to be able to separate, okay, what are the facts in this situation? What are the things that a video camera re would record versus what are all of the different stories I'm making up about it can actually help you to choose and, and respond to a situation rather than being reactive. So an example is if, I don't know, just say one of, my, one of my employees doesn't get something done in time for a deadline, I could get angry and just immediately default to, oh, this person is unreliable and tell myself stories about it. <laughs> or I could say, okay, what, what happened? Um, my assistant didn't get this particular project done at this certain time. What are the other facts I have? Well, I know that, that she didn't get it done on time. I know that she didn't communicate with me about it. So what are the different possibilities here? So instead of defaulting to, oh, she's unreliable, it could be, well, maybe, I don't know, she lost internet. Maybe uh, there was an emergency in her family. So it's like it, it gives you this opportunity to actually start to think about the infinite other possibilities and start to get curious about, well, maybe the interpretation that I had isn't actually accurate. And so are there other interpretations that are equally true or could be equally true that would actually not feel as heavy or difficult and, and give me the space to actually 
choose how I want to respond to it. And so a lot of this is really about getting out of that kind of split second reactivity where the thing happens and you don't even think about it and you do something to recognizing, okay, these are the facts. I can take a breath and pause and then get curious about, okay, what are the different possibilities here? And how do I want to choose to respond to this rather than just like going from that kind of reptile brain, like, like just reacting in the moment. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, I think it's a really good exercise to start understand ourselves yeah. and uh, aware, like what kinds of, uh, what's called uh, uh, kinds of emotion behind that kind yeah. of angry or something, right? Yeah, 100%. I actually get a lot of my clients, one of the early things that I do with them is I is I get them to get a notebook that's mm -hmm. their facts and stories notebook. And so whenever something happens during their day that causes them to feel anxious or upset or have a big emotional reaction, to mm -hmm. actually just take a moment to write down what are the facts, like a video camera would record, and what are all of the different stories that I'm making up about it? And then start looking at, okay, so what are other versions of the story? What's the opposite of the story that might be equally true? And a lot of the time, it just actually helps to bring you down and help you to feel like, oh, you know what? Like, I'm not actually at risk. There's no real danger to me here. I'm going to be okay. I don't need to freak out or get super anxious or get really angry. I can just accept myself for having those emotions and feeling them and then get clear on like, what do I want to do next? Usually uh, when uh, they, you uh, did that exercise with the ladies, what the first uh, impression of them like after they done this exercise? So what ends up happening often is is like they'll do this for a week so our calls are usually a week apart they'll do mm -hmm. it for a week and they'll come back and they'll be like wow i didn't realize how much i was making up worst case <laughs> scenarios in my life or like i realized that i'm actually creating a lot of drama where i don't have to and so it it creates this sort of space for noticing how you are subconsciously choosing something that you don't actually want. Um, and it, one of, I mean, one of my favorite things about this work is that it's really freeing for people because suddenly it's like, oh my goodness, I thought that this was how the world worked, but now I realize that like, I'm creating this reality. This isn't the objective reality. This is my interpretation of what's happening and it's not actually helping me. Well, that's true. That's true. Because uh, I'm a coach too. And I know how like we can in our mind yeah. can have so many stories created, uh, created by ourselves, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Totally. And I know you work with so many high achieving women and uh, some of um, uh, the founders and uh, uh, all accomplished a lot that kinds of uh, kinds of women's and usually from outside what we see they are already successful and they are super confident and uh, sometimes it's just uh, and they seems to know what they want and uh, so from a coach when you're working with them can you tell us what kinds of struggle they have mm. so so one of the things that I think a lot of, I guess, people generally are surprised by is that often the people who seem to have it the most put together and are like super, superpowers mm -hmm. behind the scenes have just as much self-doubt, um, if not even sometimes more than your average person because of the expectation that they're going to get everything right, that they know what they're doing, it can create this sort of tension of like, actually, sometimes, I mean, this is where a lot of these like super overachievers do burn themselves out because it's like, I have to be on all the time and there's no margin for error. There's no space for me to be human and to just sometimes not actually feel like doing the work or sometimes, I don't know, get sick or be tired. Um, and so 
I mean, some of the some of the bigger things that I notice is that even with people who are super at the top of their game, leaders of companies still often feel imposter syndrome and that drives them to continue to be better than everybody else. So there's this real piece of trying to prove yourself rather than being able to source approval from yourself and really trust that you're doing enough. There's still this drive to do more and be better. Mm -hmm. um, the need to be right is a really big issue. And so what what gets us stuck a lot of the time and puts us into this state of reactivity or competition or feeling like we're at risk is that rather than really being open and curious about, okay, what are the best ways to do this? We get attached to our own ideas and needing to be right about them. And so this actually does happen a lot with leaders across the board. It's where, where you have an idea and then if somebody else has another idea or questions your idea, you take it personally. And so instead of recognizing, oh yeah, there's all of these different possibilities, you get really attached to, no, 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 I need to be right. And, and that's where a lot of workplace drama comes into place. That's also where in organizations, you can end up with a culture where there isn't the psychological safety that your employees can be innovative and they can challenge the ideas of the leadership and ultimately like make better products or do better work because they're so afraid that their leaders are going to be reactive and are going to shoot down their ideas or or that it like becomes political that then it kind of it it locks everything into place in a way that's not really good for anyone so helping leaders to get out of that sort of fear-based needing to be right and reactivity and like the need to win mode to to and shifting to really being creative and getting curious about like how can we create the best product possible how can we create win for all solutions how can we make this the best we can for everyone involved like i mean clearly that's more fun in terms of what the workplace is like, but it often brings with it massive financial benefits because then you start seeing opportunities in places where you wouldn't have seen them if you kind of had that tunnel vision of like, this is how we have to do things. Mm -hmm. You talk about the imposter syndrome. Uh, can you tell us more? Yeah, uh, you, did you hear me? No, you froze for a moment. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, you just talked about imposter syndromes. Can you uh, tell us more about that? Um, so imposter syndrome is the feeling that you have when you don't feel like you're good enough to be doing whatever work it is that you're doing. So this often happens or comes up a lot for people when they get a promotion at work, when they're stepping into a management or leadership position and they start to doubt their own abilities. Mm -hmm. um, what, I, what I believe is that most of the time imposter syndrome is actually linked to the need for approval or positive feedback from mm -hmm. other people. And so, the reason that you feel like you aren't maybe not good enough or you don't know what you're doing is because your whole life, probably from the time you were two years old, everything was about getting approval from other people and, and winning for, on somebody else's terms. So success was what is how other people see success, not how I feel about what I've done and what I'm accomplishing. And so one of the ways that I help people to sort of shift away from imposter syndrome, and I went through this myself in my own life, was really getting clear on how do I feel about what I'm doing? Do I feel clear? Do I trust myself? The self-trust piece is really key so that I can let go of always looking to somebody else to tell me that I'm getting it right. Because as as we all know, once you finish your studies, you're no longer getting graded on your work. You might be stepping into a workplace, and I mean, depending on the type of workplace where you're getting performance evaluations and you're still getting the kind of clear external validation, mm -hmm. but ultimately you're gonna be better off if you can trust yourself 
that you're doing the best job you can, that you know what you're doing, that you trust that you are actually the best person for the job or have great innovative solutions. And you can let go of that need to be right that I was talking about and shift more into being curious about how do we make a better product. And so if somebody on my team, just say I'm the leader and somebody on my team is questioning my approach or my ideas, rather than getting defensive and being like, oh my God, they're judging me. They don't think I'm a good leader. I can really listen to them and say, hey, that's a really great point. I'd love you to expand on that. I wonder how we can incorporate that into this new project or whatever it is. So it's it's really this where, where in imposter syndrome, I feel is like getting stuck in like, there's a way you're supposed to be and I need to be that way. The shift out of that and to really being a great leader is recognizing there is no one right way to do anything. Find it and get curious about it. Yeah, that that's true. And uh, I heard uh, like I know so many women, special women, have that problem. Yeah. And uh, when you mention about like trust yourself, you do the the best work. And um, I just think about another thing like um, healthy uh, perfectionist and perfectionist. Because uh, when we're talking about high achieving women, I think majority of them always wants to do the best and yeah. uh, make everything perfect. So uh, do, uh, do you have any, like I just tell us like how many of the clients have this kind of problem? Oh my goodness, almost all of them. Um, I would say that the majority of the women I work with struggle mm -hmm. with perfectionism, uh, with putting a lot of pressure on themselves, with needing to prove themselves. Um, and a lot of that comes from childhood, comes from getting good grades, from, from being kind of a lot applauded or raised above other people for doing things really well for getting it right and so then you learn this kind of reaction of like okay well I have to be perfect I have to do it right all the time or I'm failing so rather than recognizing that there's like you know it's a curve it's like, it's either this or it's like nothing. And so for me, um, and I mentioned this in, in the interview the other day, like I was the ultimate overachiever. Like I, I graduated from high school with high nineties in everything. I got to university, I got A's and A minuses, even though I was at McGill, which was really, really hard to ac accomplish. I cried over B's and C's when I got them in my first year. It was horrible. Like the experience was really intense for me. And it was only when I got to my work at Real Ventures and I actually burned out that I started to realize that my need to be better than anyone else could ever imagine to do the best work possible was actually just driving me into the ground. I was exhausting myself. And I'm really grateful to her, but my boss basically said to me, like, we just need you to do a good enough job. We don't need it to be perfect. You don't need to spend an extra five hours working on, a, on this um, article or whatever the project. Oh, I then couldn't hear you. Oh, okay. Sorry, I was just saying you don't need to like keep going until it's perfect. If you can get it to kind of 80% of the way there, that's mm -hmm. probably good enough. I've spent a lot of time working super hard. Lorraine, I, I think we have a problem and sometimes I can hear you and then I couldn't hear you. Can you hear me again? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, good. Um, I was just saying that some often when you are a perfectionist and you've spent your whole life working to like a really high standard, mm -hmm. even your 80% is probably better than most of the other people's 100%. So to recognize that rather than getting stuck on, I have to do it perfectly, mm -hmm. just doing it is actually probably going to be further ahead and it's going to give you the momentum that other people who haven't even started 
are not even close to where you are. That that's true. I I think perfectionist, uh, their uh, mind is just black and white. If yeah. I do it, I need to do it perfectly, and otherwise it's a fail. Yeah. And um, this, I just let me remember that growth uh, mindset. Mm -hmm. So no matter like a. Even you failed, but you still learn a lot from the this, this, this past, right? Yeah. Oh my goodness. So much. And I, I mean, part of the reason I love the work I do is I learn every single day. I'm learning from my clients. I'm learning, like I love learning. So I'm taking more courses. I'm reading more. I'm working with my own coach. Um, I'm working with a spiritual teacher. Like there's just, there's always so much opportunity to shift and grow. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right, like going from that fixed mindset of there's a right or a wrong way to do it. And like failure feels like a really big deal if you make it personal. Whereas if failure just becomes like, if you treat life like a science experiment, well, getting it wrong is just part of it. It's like, yeah. okay, I had a hypothesis and I tested it. And the results were not what I expected. So now I'm going to create a new hypothesis and I'm going to test that and we'll see what the results are. And it's not, doesn't make me any less intelligent or valuable because I didn't get it right the first time. It just means that I'm curious and trying to learn new things. Yeah. If from that way, like the life is going to be uh, so wonderful and the curiosity and, and uh, full of uh, things to discover. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I can, I can totally acknowledge that my life is way more fun since I stopped trying to get everything right. And I shifted <laughs> more into what's interesting and how can I learn more? Um, and I've always been a curious person, but that perfectionism the need to like prove myself and get things right really did make it harder and it made it feel heavier or less fun than it can when you're just really there to learn and grow. Yeah, that's true, that's true. And um, I think a lot of high achieving women, they have a, a standard uh, for their uh, definition of success. And uh, so uh, as a coach, can you share with us, uh, what is your definition of success? Mm. Oh, I love that question. Uh, so, so for me personally, my definition of success is accomplishing the, the goals that I set for myself from a place of commitment and curiosity and, and joy and play. So it's like, I could, I don't know, I could make a million dollars in my business, but if I'm really grinding and waking up with a pain, with panic attacks and like that to me is not true success. True success is being able to approach whatever it is, whatever endeavor with ease and lightness and to, to learn and grow from it, no matter the outcome. And Oftentimes, yes, like I could make a million dollars in my business. If I made a million dollars from a place of collaboration and like really I'm doing this to serve other people and to make a difference in the world, like that feels like success to me. Making the money and getting the accolades, but really still feeling like an imposter or feeling like I'm not getting it right or I need to do more, that doesn't to me actually align with what success should be so i guess i couldn't hear you again <laughs> just the last part i didn't hear that <laughs> yeah i was just saying to summarize i think that success is actually a feeling it's like for me to be successful is mm -hmm. to feel good and to feel joyful and to enjoy the work that i'm doing and the life that i'm leading mm -hmm. and I would be making uh is the yeah. internet still uh yeah a little bit yeah but now we can hear you yeah it was, I was just saying even if that means that I potentially get I'm I'm not as successful in the like this is how people are supposed to be successful if I'm mm -hmm. actually happier 
and I get to spend more time with my kids and my husband and I get to do the things I love. Well, to me, that that's what true success looks like. Yeah, that's true. I think like a successful feeling that is like a fulfilled, uh, that, that kind of uh, feeling. And I know you made the transition uh, to become an executive leader, a leadership coach yeah. during the pandemic time. And I think that that time must have so many uncertainties. And I think make that kind of transition is scary. And uh, can you tell us what made you to take that big step and then uh, to do uh, to to make the big decision to do that? Um, so what it's funny because once I realized that this was the work that I wanted to be doing, mm -hmm. it actually felt scarier for me to stay in the, the job that I was doing at real and be bored to be perfectly honest, than to take the risk and jump into this new career and starting my own business. Mm -hmm. um, I think to go back to that, that like the difference between imposter syndrome and like really trusting yourself is that mm -hmm. I deep down, I knew from the work that I had done, from the coaching I'd had from the, we did a, a year of conscious leadership training at Real Ventures. It felt so clear to me that this was the work I was supposed to be doing that I didn't really question whether or not I would be able to be successful in it at some point, I was just really excited about being able to go out and do trainings and meet new people and be part of this new community. And I think a part of it actually that helped me was that I had already met a lot of the people who I now collaborate with at the time through my work in VC. I already had a really great network and I didn't really doubt because in the past, I've worked as a freelancer. I had a media, like I had my own very small media agency when I was in my 20s. I knew that no matter what happened, I would still be able to do work as a copywriter or in communications, even as I was as creating my coaching practice. Um, what I didn't expect was how quickly I would go from doing the work that I was good at, but not as passionate about, to being full-time facilitating um, mastermind groups and doing one-on-one -on -one coaching and really getting to see the impact of my work on people because there clearly is a need. I think another thing that happened in COVID is a lot of people started to reflect on their lives and it's like, is this it? This isn't what I wanted. And so they started to seek out coaches. And so it really felt like just the right time for this transition for me. And I dived in head first and that's, I mean, that's how I do things. And I'm really glad that I took that leap and it, yes, it was scary. And there were moments where I was like, I couldn't believe that I was setting the types of goals I was setting and that I was choosing to do the work that I was doing but I did it and I'm continuing to do it. And I, it, I feel like I am proof of the fact that if you are willing to let fear come along for the ride, instead of letting fear control you, you can really create anything that you put your mind to. Okay. <laughs> so there's a scary, but it's a lot of uh, uh, curiosity, just finding what's, are uh, really uh, in front of us, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think we're always gonna have fear. Like, I don't think that's ever going to change. I don't imagine, and I actually think that fear is healthy. Like you should be thinking through what could happen. It's just when you let the fear guide you that it gets in the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, like you'll find your passion. And I know in our community, there's uh, so many young uh, professionals and they do know they don't like their job, but they don't know what's their passion, how to find the passion. And then uh, do you have any advice for them? 
Yeah. So, so there are actually a number of different exercises I do with my clients to help them to get clear on what they're passionate about. And I think one of the easiest ways to identify it is to actually think about what you did for fun when you were a child. What were the activities or the types of circumstances or situations that really helped you to feel the most alive? And so, for instance, for me, I loved, I loved performing. I loved writing plays. I loved being around other people and, and talking. I've always loved talking. (laughs) And, and so for me, it was like thinking back to what were the, the highlights of my life? Well, like getting plays professionally produced or speaking in public, do like there were certain things for me that were really, really exciting. And so for me, when I was coming back to, okay, what do I really want to be doing? It was really clear. Okay. Those are the things that, that bring me joy that I also happen to be better at than a lot of other people. And so I think it's finding that sweet spot of taking the time to really get clear on what are the aspects of the work that you do or of your hobbies or pastimes or like what you do in your life that you love the most and that you also happen to be better at than a lot of other people. And then, I mean, the next piece really is just taking the risk of claiming it and recognizing, okay, in my current job, can I speak with my manager or my, or, or a supervisor or my colleague so that I'm spending more and more of my time doing those things that feel exciting and that I'm really good at and less of my time doing the stuff that is boring for me or frustrating or where I don't love it, but I'm actually okay at it. And so it's really getting clear on like, what's, I mean, I call it, or a lot of, a lot of coaches call it your zone of genius. Like what are the things that I'm really exceptional at Uh versus my, the things that I'm kind of okay at, or I'm competent, or I'm actually pretty good at, but feel really draining for me. And I think that that, when you can get clear on that, it can really help you to guide, okay, what are the next steps that I'm going to take in my career? Um, Because not everybody will actually enjoy, I don't know, being a business owner or being a manager. Um, Some people actually really love systems and processes and that's perfectly fine. So if you're a person who loves systems and processes, how do you stay connected to the systems and processes at work instead of having to do the strategy, for instance? Mm -hmm. So it's just getting clear on the fact that we're all different and there's nothing wrong with, with liking one thing better than another thing. We just in order for the workplace to benefit from our special gifts, we need to own them and claim them and say, hey, I'm actually really good at this and I really enjoy it. Can I focus on doing this kind of work and give this part of my job to somebody else? Yeah, that, that's true. And uh, uh, last time, one of the coach come to uh, provide training for our team and we done the Gallup stress. And then each, everybody is different. Yeah. Like, like I'm, I think like one of it, uh, uh, I don't have any excursion in that area. So I was very about no excursion. And then uh, the coach just told me, it's okay. Usually the boss always don't have that kind of excursion. <laughs> but sometimes you just worry about huh? uh, about that. Like you want to have it all. That's sometimes yeah. that's the, yeah. Yeah, I think, that, I think that one of the best parts about coaching mm-hmm. for me is helping people to recognize that there's no one right or wrong or better way to be, that we mm-hmm. all just are different and we all have, our, our superpowers. And we also have the stuff that we just don't like and that that's totally okay. Sometimes we're going to have to do the things we don't like. And I think that those are the opportunities to really practice. Like, <laughs> how am I showing up? How am I feeling about this? Is there a way for me to approach this so that it doesn't feel so awful? Um, but with the other things to take the time to really recognize like what lights you up 
you're going to have a better time in life and like in your personal life, as well as your professional life. Cause if you're spending your whole work day doing work, that's incredibly draining, well, you're probably going to get home and be kind of grumpy. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. And uh, women yeah, tend to see competition everywhere. And uh, we tend to uh, compare with each other. And uh, how do you think we should turn off the competition mode and turn on the collaboration mode? Mm. So I think that this is this is another place where oftentimes when we feel competitive with other women, it's because they are doing or we perceive that they have something that either we don't allow ourselves to be that way or to do things that way, or we wish that we were like them. And so I think a lot of the time it's just really about noticing, oh, I have this immediate dislike for this person. What is that about me? Because most of the time is actually not about them. It's about me. And can I accept myself for having whatever thoughts I was having and then get curious? I mean, going back to curiosity, if you can get curious about another person and their situation and create a real connection with them, chances are you're going to be able to overcome any feelings of competition you have because you're going to see them just as another human being and not as somebody who's like on a scale that you're trying to be above them. Like, cause a lot of the time we get trapped in this hierarchical thinking where it's like, as you said, it's a competition. So it's like, am I better than them? And I, am I worse than them? And mm -hmm. so rather than going straight to those thoughts or when you have those thoughts, you can just get curious about it and wonder, okay, well, like what's making me judge this person. And I wonder what they think about this thing. And so so you can actually find what you have in common with the person or find the places where you do connect and kind of get yourself out of that competition so that you don't feel like you're constantly having to put on a show or be different from who you are because you're perceiving other people as something that chances are they're not even that way. You're just making it up. <laughs> and uh, now we should talk about fact and the story again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and usually that when you don't like some uh, kinds of uh, personality, usually that is reflection from yeah. your side. 100%. Yeah. 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 And I mean, I can actually give the example with my sister-in-law. She's a really successful businesswoman. Mm -hmm. And I remember... I don't know, that like the early days of her and my brother being together, mm -hmm. she used to just rub me the wrong way in certain respects. And I realized it was because I was a bit jealous of her because oh. she was so successful and she took up a lot of space and she was the boss. And so there was a part of me that was like, well, like I don't get to be that bossy. I don't get yes. to show up that way. And so instead of getting curious about it, and I mean, now we are like really good, like we're really close and I adore her. It was just recognizing like she's been a boss since she was 23. Of course, that's how she shows up. I had to grow into that. And so it's like recognizing once again, like, what is this saying about me? Is this me making myself I, I think in that case, I was diminishing myself and being like, oh, I'm not as good as her rather than recognizing like we've just had totally different lives grown up in completely different parts of the world. And that's what makes us both unique and special. And we don't have to be in competition with each other. Yeah, that I love that unique and special. Each of us is unique and special. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah, really. and, and you are a wife and a mother. How do you balance? I know you use the balance is not a good word, but to, <gasps> what's the choose? What's the best for you? And then what's the best for your family? Let's say for your kids and your husband. Yeah. So one of the things that became really clear after I burned out when I was working at Real Ventures and sort of started into this journey of conscious leadership was recognizing mm -hmm. that 
when I was on this whole, like needing to be the best super mom, do all of the things I was actually not as present with my kids or my husband as I could be, because I was trying to control everything. And I was trying to like make it perfect and get my kids in all of the programs and, and like do everything right. And so what I really shifted to was for my daughters, like helping them to identify the things that they love to do and to encourage them in those ways. So my older daughter is a really talented artist and like, that's kind of all she does. And so putting her in a lot of different programs, like ultimately she was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, we had an art teacher. We actually had a, a private tutor for her for a while doing like anime style drawing. And she also didn't really enjoy that. And so I, I kind of stepped back and I respected what she wanted and it, mm-hmm. it feels way better. And now, I mean, she's getting older. She still has her interests that she's really into. And I just do my best to support her in that way. Um, and in the same way with my husband, I mean, he is incredibly supportive. He's so proud of me. We have so much fun together and he, he actually enjoys, we both enjoy the fact that I travel a lot and that we have kind of space to do our own thing because then when we are together, we're really together and we get to really have a great time. And so we make a point of having date nights, probably only once a month, to be honest, but like we we make, we make the effort and we make the time to spend together. We both really enjoy hanging out. Um, and I feel the same way with my kids where I carve out time like to pick my older daughter up from school or to go to the park or go do something in nature with my younger daughter who's really like into, into nature and animals. And mm-hmm. it just, it feels really good to be able to set the example of like, I love my work. I love my business. I love what I do. And when I'm with you, I'm going to be a hundred percent with you. I'm not going to be thinking about work or trying to get five things done at the same time. Um, and I guess the one other little piece that I can add to this is that I got better at outsourcing the things that I don't need to do myself. And so Mm -hmm. we actually have like, we have a cleaner and we have a nanny who comes after school and helps my daughter with her homework. And that was something that for a long time, I was like, oh, there's no way we can do that. Or it was like, whatever excuses I was making up, we can't afford it. Or I'm supposed to do it because I'm her mom or like, this is important connection time. Mm -hmm. And then I actually realized, you know what, like, she has a better time doing her homework with Brie and I have a better time because when I, I can work for an extra couple of hours in the afternoon, instead of going straight from working to cleaning the kitchen and making dinner, I have somebody else who's helping with cleaning the kitchen and packing the school lunches and doing those things. So it was really getting clear on like, what am I, what are my priorities? What's important to me? how do I spend my time doing the things that are the most valuable to me and my family? And are there creative ways that we can figure out how to get somebody else to help? Or maybe in some cases, getting my daughters to do more chores um, so that, so that it feels like it's shared. And, and I mean, yes, there is a certain level of privilege and being able to afford to pay somebody to help us. But I think, for a, a long time, I probably could have afforded it, but I didn't do it because I felt like I was supposed to do it myself. So sometimes it's just getting clear on like, why are you not asking for help? What are the stories that you're making up about what asking for help means? Because maybe getting your mom or a fa- like another family member to help out more so that you can have more time with your kids is actually what you really need. Yeah, um, and you're talking and you're talking about control at the beginning. I think sometimes we just fight to control everything. And uh, I think that's it's just see, maybe the control has given us that kind of uh, safety yeah. feeling, right? Yeah. yeah, so that's, uh, and, and then we want to control everything and then want to do everything uh, just at the beginning, you said, 
maybe I don't enjoy it or mm -hmm. and I have to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think that there's something to be said for allowing yourself to embrace uncertainty and to mm -hmm. be in like that really uncomfortable place where you don't know what's going to happen and practice being there. And the more time you let yourself be in the uncertainty, the more freeing you start to realize it is because a lot of the time the control, like it's not real anyhow. Like we, we make up, we think that we have control, but it's very clear that we don't really quickly when things that are outside of our control go wrong or differently from how we thought they would. And so mm -hmm. I think that going back to the facts and stories, it's like, if you can let go of deciding how things should or shouldn't be and just accept that the world shows up the way that the world shows up and can I get curious about it suddenly things actually feel a lot lighter because it's it's all like a crazy ride instead of something <laughs> that you're trying to control all the time yes okay and Jen uh tell us about shine fast leadership um so shine plus, plus leadership is a an organization that we help women to overcome the beliefs and behaviors that keep them feeling small or grinding or overwhelmed so that they can really create the outcomes they want in life. They can feel like they're enjoying their work and they can create success on their own terms. Um, so I run a number of different programs. I actually have uh, a different format of a program that I've run a number of times. It's called Clarity, and it's a 12-week um, hybrid. So there's it's online, there's video modules and readings, but there's also group coaching calls um, every other week. And it's really there to help women to get clear on who they are, on how they want to be, and to become the best communicators, um, to learn how to enroll other people in their vision, so selling their ideas, um, really getting confident and recognizing how to create the lives that they want and be the leaders that they want to be. So that's one of my programs. I also have a six month program that involves a retreat in Canada in, the, in September and then a graduation retreat in Costa Rica in February. Um, and it's a super, that program goes even deeper in terms of like really getting into how you're showing up in the world and, and what you wanna create and be in your life. Um, and then I also do one-on-one -on -one coaching. So I work with clients one-on-one, -on -one, usually either over six months or a year. And that's much more hands-on, like getting super clear on like who you are and, and goal setting get, is involved in that process as well. With all of my programs, we really look at like one of the first questions we ask is like, what do you want to create in your life in the next six months or the next year? And then mm -hmm. I help my clients to create that or something even better by helping them to, to kind of get those obstacles out of the way um, and get clearer on how they want to be in the world. Um, so it's not just me. I have, a, I have a team of women, most of whom actually have come through my programs um, mm -hmm. who work with me. And it really is just for me, it's such a privilege to be able to do this work with ambitious women and see them step into being the type of leader they want to be and mm -hmm. having better relationships with their children and their partners and their colleagues and their co-founders. And, and really like one of the things that one of my clients has said to me, and a few of them have said these in different ways, is that they came to me to become better leaders and they came out of the program happier people. And for me, that's just the best thing that, that I can do in the world is to be able to help people to not only lead from a powerful place, but actually enjoy their lives more. Mm -hmm. I can see how, uh, how much you enjoy that when you're talking about and uh, really like it shines and uh, your, your eyes light it up. That's mm -hmm. really good one. Let me see uh, if there are any questions in our, okay. 
I said, finally, definition of mentors uh, vs. coach. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here. Uh, there is one question here. Hi, Laureen. I really love what you mentioned about getting, uh, getting rid of uh, the comp uh, com competing mindset. And the trap of uh, hierarchy and to connect with uh, peoples by finding something in common. Can mm -hmm. you share any li uh, life stories that how this shift of mindset help you or your clients successfully connect with their scenario? Uh, scenario? senior or connect with their senior executives at workplace when they are junior thank you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so so something that is really interesting when it comes to these kind of power dynamics in businesses or in in workplaces is that when you are in the position when you're a junior um, mm -hmm. and you're you're trying to connect with somebody who's in a in a position of power that a lot of the time it's about helping the other person. So helping your boss or your supervisor to see their problem in a different light. So you're going to connect with them by asking questions about like, what is, what it is that they're trying to solve, helping them to get clearer and clearer. There's actually something called the five whys. So you're really like digging deeper and deeper with each question you ask trying to get clear on like what's really underneath it and then help them to see that you're going to help them to shift or transform or get the outcome that they're looking for through reframing the problem for them. And so a lot of the time, this really is a matter of getting clear. Like if I'm in a position where, for instance, I want to get a raise, um, helping my boss to see the benefits to the organization of me stepping up into a, a position where I'm taking on more responsibility, for instance, or like really helping to reframe whatever it is. The light went out. Um, so it feels like a benefit to the other person. Um, and then the flip side of that is if you are a person who's in the position of power, is to really get curious about the other person's mindset. And I think that this, this is relevant in both directions, but if you can put yourself in the shoes of the other person and try to understand where they're coming from, you're going to have a much easier time of connecting with them because you're actually going to be able to empathize and you're going to be able to see, okay, you know what, I'm... I understand that this person, I mean, for instance, if it is your boss, like this person is under a lot of pressure. These are the things that they're trying to do. And so rather than just seeing them as like this all powerful person to really understand, try to get into their shoes and see how, how they are experiencing life. And are there ways that I can help them that will actually help them to feel good. And that, that creates that connection. Okay. Okay. That that's a good answer. And Eileen, if you have any further question, uh, you can uh, put it here. But it's just uh, I think I need to get reading glasses. <laughs> I get the <to> start. <laughs> okay. She uh, said uh, Lisa just saying she is awesome. Said Maureen, you are awesome. Mm. <laughs> Okay, we don't have any questions here anymore, and it's just one minute before we go. And last time we're talking about uh, with we work in women community, and uh, yesterday when we published your article, and uh, uh, some of the ladies ask about your programs, and did we got any discount for that? Yes, we do. Joy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so if you're interested, I do have a new program. It launches on the 1st of June. It's the Clarity Program. And for the first 10 women from We Working Women who sign up, you'll get a $250 discount. Um, so I can share that with your community. You can send that out in whatever ways that, that you need to. Um, mm -hmm. But I would love to have 
whoever is interested in working with me, uh, reach out, connect with me, apply to join the program or register. And um, I really hope that I can, I mean, that you've enjoyed learning from me tonight. And I really hope that I can connect with some of the women in this, in this community. Cause I think it's, I mean, as you've heard, I love this work and I think it's super important. And my favorite thing is seeing women really step into their power and into living the lives that they want to live without all of the perfectionism and imposter syndrome getting in the way. Yeah, that, that's true. That's because uh, you're working with women. Uh, uh, when I read the book, How Women Rise, and I realized like some problem is only a majority of the women have it, but for men, they don't have it. So as that's that's the another reason I'm so um, like fulfilled, like when I work with our uh, community uh, and just uh, like same like you, like solve the problem and because uh, they can uh, they can uh, meet together and talk about what kinds of uh, uh, struggles they have and then they can solve the problem. That's really a uh, fulfillment uh, for me, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Okay, they said, thank you so much, Lauren. Uh, thank you for taking the time and join us today. And I think uh, we're gonna find another chance, maybe talk further about some pro uh, like uh, the problems we are facing and uh, how to solve it. Yeah, okay. I would love that. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, Bye. to join us live uh, stream and uh, have a good night. Bye.